Good evening, everyone. Um, today we have the Top Hat Homework Part 2. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say the same things as last time, but I'm going to put a disclaimer at the start right here. In the syllabus, the teacher says that we are allowed to help each other with homework. There's no academic dishonesty here. I saw a few comments um, on the last video on about that, and I know a lot of people left the group me whenever I sent that, but there's um it's complete it's completely fair game and yeah just want to make sure we're all clear there and then second of all the other thing um if you haven't done the homework like if you haven't worked it out yourself once definitely do that uh and then if you get stuck you can look up the problem you need help with i don't want y'all to uh just like skate by with all the answers and then be out of luck on the test um so yeah so without further ado, let's uh, get into it. So question one. All right. So which of the following is, is an example of absolute advantage? Uh, so an absolute advantage is whenever you were able to produce more of something or you were just better at something on paper. Um, so whenever we look at this, uh, a says, Amy is smart and performs well in exams. That's good, but we have nothing to compare it to. Like, she doesn't have an absolute advantage, because what would she have an advantage over? Like, who would she have an advantage over? Nick has an advantage over other industry, over others in the industry, because he knows many software programs. Now, this may be tricky, um, and I saw a few people pick this one, but that's not the answer because it doesn't show you what other people's knowledge. You need to see two separate people and like their own abilities. Cause this is just saying he has an advantage over others, but there's no like, there's no one that he's comparing it to. Um, so that's why it's not it. Also, there's no quantity there. It just kind of says there's more. Um, C, Tom does his math homework in two hours while Harry only takes 30 minutes to do his. Th that's the correct answer. It's C, this is because it gives you two people, and it gives you the two numbers for the task, and it's very clear that someone is better at the task than the other person, meaning they have the absolute advantage. And yeah, and it's not D because Charlie enjoys skiing, and while Ryan enjoys hiking, that has nothing to do. There's no advantage there. All right. Question 2A. In an hour, Simon can catch four pounds of pickerel or eight pounds of apples. In an hour... Fred can catch four pounds of pickerel or 20 pounds of apples. The opportunity cost of it, catching a pound of pickerel is blank for Simon than Fred. And the opportunity cost of, of picking an apple is blank for Simon than Fred. So I'm going to switch over to the um, paper so you can see us work it out. All right, y'all are on our Febreze can again, so I apologize about that. So Simon catches four pickerel and eight apples, while Fred catches four pickerel and 20 apples. So we want to know who has the higher and lower opportunity cost. It asks both in terms of Simon's catches. So whenever Simon chooses to catch pickerel, its opportunity cost is what you sacrifice over what you gain. Uh, sacrifice over gain. And in the first blank, it's saying that we want to find out the opportunity cost for catching pickerel. So when he catches pickerel, he catches four of them, so that's his gain. But what he loses out on is the eight apples he could have been catching in that hour, um, or picking, I guess, which makes his opportunity cost two. And now, so, and then let's calculate Fred's opportunity cost for the same thing. So whenever Fred's doing this, Fred uh, gains four uh, pickerel, but loses out on 20 apples which makes his opportunity cost five so fred's opportunity cost is higher than um simon's which means uh yeah so the opportunity cost of a pound of pickerel is lower for simon than fred since fred's is higher because this is a uh, fred oh whoops i should look at the paper and not the camera uh so this is fred and this is simon and yeah so then the second blank is the opportunity cost of picking a pound of apples is blank for Simon and Fred. So we're just going to do the exact same thing, 
but with apples. So whenever Simon uh, picks apples, he gains eight, but loses out on four, which is one half. And then whenever Fred, uh, that's supposed to be an S, that's Simon. And then whenever Fred picks apples, he gains 20 and loses out on four, which is only one fifth. That makes his opportunity cost lower here. So for the blank, it says, the opportunity cost of picking a pound of apples is blank for Simon than Fred. Well, Simon says one half and Fred's is one fifth, meaning Simon's opportunity cost is higher. Um, so yeah, question three, or question two B. In an hour, Simon can catch four pounds of pickerel. Uh, it's the same thing as saying everything we know. So blank has a comparative advantage in producing blank. Um, well, we know that Simon's opportunity cost for the pickerel is uh, is less than Fred's opportunity cost. And Fred's opportunity cost for picking apples is less than Simon's. So all we have to do is find one of those. And uh, the options are Fred for pickerel, which we know is not true because Fred uh, has the higher opportunity cost here. Um, Simon for pickerel. Well, let's go to pickerel, Simon. His is lower, so he should specialize there. Um, and yeah, that's the answer. An alternative correct answer would be Fred for apples, but that's not there. Um, and then question three, okay. So I'm gonna switch to the regular view. I actually lied, we're gonna stay in this view. Uh, my bad, this says cookies at the end. I'll try to write it smaller next time. But so question three, A. Martha can produce 50 quilts or 200 uh, batches of chocolate chip cookies in a month, while Jane can produce 10 quilts or five batches of chocolate chip cookies in a month. Distinguish between the comparative advantage and absolute advantage. Blank has an absolute advantage in both goods. As we know, an absolute advantage is whenever you are able to produce more of it. It has nothing to do with opportunity cost. So here it is very clear that Martha can produce both more quilts and more batches of cookies. So the answer is B, Martha. But then we go to the next part of this question, which is 3B. So it states the same uh, parameters of Martha and Jane. And it says distinguish between the comparative advantage and the absolute advantage. Blank has a comparative advantage in quilts and blank has a per uh, comparative advantage in cookies. So this is what we're gonna do here. So let's, uh, Let's do quilts. Um, so for quilts, quilts, Martha, we already know uh, the opportunity cost is what you lose when you choose. So lose over choose. I'm gonna start writing it like that just uh, for simplicity's sake and saving time. So for quilts, Martha can make 50. Uh, so she chooses to make 50 but she loses out on 200 cookies she could be making in that month. So this is Martha. And then for Jane, whenever she chooses to make quilts, she can make 10 and she only loses out on five batches of cookies. So these are their opportunity costs for making quilts. Martha's is four, while Jane's is only one half. Jane's opportunity cost is less, so Jane has the comparative advantage in quilts. And as we know, you cannot have a comparative advantage in both goods. So if Jane has the comparative advantage in quilt, Martha has the comparative advantage in chocolate chip cookies. So the answer to this question is D, Jane has the comparative advantage in quilts and Martha has the comparative advantage in chocolate chip cookies. Okay, so question four. Why do people specialize in trade? With specialization and trade, people can blank. Okay, so Let's look at the options here. Produce at a point outside of their production possibility curve. That is not, tr uh, that's not true. The only way, you can never produce outside of your production possibility curve. That is an unattainable place. Now, whenever you're, there could be technological developments that would allow you to reach that point, but your curve is gonna match it. So you're never gonna be producing outside the curve. Uh, uh, so then B says produce and consume at a point outside of their peep, uh, production possibility curve. Well, if you can't produce outside of your curve, then this is automatically wrong. C, consume at a point outside of the uh, production possibility curve. 
This is the correct answer, and let me explain why. Whenever you trade, and whenever there's specialization of trade and people who are better at things or trading things, there's going to be more of everything in the economy. Just uh, that's why trade happens. Um, for the example she showed in class was the thing with bikes, um, and I can show an example right now uh, with the Martha making quilts and Jane or with Jane making quilts and Martha making cookies. If Martha were to make cookies, um, so she would make 200 cookies a month, then Jane were to make quilts, uh, and how many quilts does she make? And yeah, make her 10 quilts a month. Whenever they find terms to agree with trade, they'll end up with more than they would have if they just tried to produce somewhere on their own uh, production possibility curve. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain without showing numbers and visualizing it but yeah the whole point of trade is so you can consume on a point outside of your production possibility curve and you are producing what you're better at producing and you're playing to your advantages question 5a the restaurant big lobster sells lobster and fish and so too does the restaurant h salt if Big Lobster's opportunity cost of preparing, uh, preparing lobster exceeds H. Salt's opportunity cost of preparing, uh, preparing lobster, then blank. So whenever Big Lobster has a higher opportunity cost than H. Salt, um, that whenever it comes to producing lo lobster, H. Salt is going to be better at producing lobster because um, that's what comparative advantage is. So whenever you go down to the questions, or the options and the answer choices, there you want to find which one says that H salt has the comparative advantage since Big Lobster's opportunity cost is higher, and that is C. H salt has a, compar a comparative advantage in preparing lobster. Question five B. So same thing that we just saw um, with Big Lobster and H salt. So if H salt and Big Lobster decide to specialize in trade then the source of the gains from trade between H salt and Big Lobster is blank. Now, the reason they're trading is because one of them is better at producing lobster and the other is better at producing fish. And the reason that one is better than the other is due to their opportunity costs. So let's look at the options here. Equal opportunity cost. If there was an equal opportunity cost, there would be no reason to trade. That is the only time that trade um, will not be needed as if uh, the two countries have exactly equal opportunity cost, which we already know that's not true. So we can rule out A. The elimination of comparative advantages. This isn't true at all. The, the answer to the last question was that there was a comparative advantage. Um, there will always be a comparative advantage unless there's equal opportunity cost. Um, so it's not B. C, the elimination of absolute advantage. This one just doesn't make any sense. Um, that, like, we don't even know anything about the absolute advantage, but, like, one of them's just going to be better at one of them, you know? Like, one of them's going to produce either fish or lobster better, absolutely, as an absolute advantage. Um, but it's just, honestly, you can't really eliminate an absolute advantage. And then D is divergent opportunity cost. And that is our correct answer. Uh... Because since they have different opportunity costs for uh, producing these different objects, they're going to want to trade. So that way they can pr uh, consume outside of the production possibility curve. Excuse me. Okay. All right. I'm going to switch to the paper for question six. Okay. So Sue can produce 50 caps or 10 jackets in an hour. And Tessa can produce 70 caps or 7 jackets in an hour. Sue's opportunity cost of producing a cap is blank jackets, and Tessa's opportunity cost of producing a cap is blank jackets. So both of these are asking for the people's opportunity cost whenever they produce one cap. Um, so yeah, let's just do this so we know, again, opportunity cost is what you lose when you choose or what you sacrifice uh, or sacrifice over gain. So here for Sue... Sue is choosing to make 50 caps, but she's losing 10 jackets, and her opportunity, oh, whoops, her opportunity cost is one-fifth, or 0.2. And then Tessa 
is, again, choosing to make 70 caps, but losing out on seven jackets, making her opportunity cost lower at point one. So this is just asking for the two numbers. So Sue's is point two and Tessa's is point one, which is answer choice A. Uh, so that's how you do that. But for question 6B, it says, blank has a comparative advantage in producing caps. If Sue and Tessa each have each specialized in producing a good in which they have a comparative advantage in and trade one jacket for seven caps, blank. So let's tackle the first part of this question. Blank has a comparative advantage in producing caps. Well, we've already seen what both of these people or what both of their opportunity costs are when producing a cap. And Tessa's is lower. So Tessa has the comparative advantage in producing caps. So if Sue and Tessa each specialize in trade in producing the good in which they have a comparative advantage in, which uh, Sue's is jackets, um, blank. So if they both are utilizing their comparative advantage and trade one jacket for seven caps, my bad, y'all. I uh, didn't have enough room to exemplify this. So right now I just set up this table. Um, so we, we already found out that um, Tessa has the comparative advantage in caps and that Sue has the comparative advantage in um, jackets. So we just want to find out if the terms of trade uh, seven caps for one jacket is worth it. Um, one jacket for seven caps. So whenever Tessa is producing 70 caps, um, she's losing out on seven jackets. So, or yeah, so for one jacket she makes, which is what she chooses, she would lose 70 caps because that's opportunity cost. So that is 10. So whenever she made one jacket, she could lose out on 10 caps. So these, this term is good for Tessa. But now we have to see if it's good for Sue. Now, Sue right here is making her 10 caps, or 10 jackets. So Sue, when she makes out on, when she makes 10 jackets, she loses out on uh, 50 caps. So her opportunity cost is five. So she would be getting seven caps here. And, cause like right now, every time she makes one jacket, she loses out on five caps. So, Whenever she gets seven caps for one jacket, these terms benefit both people. Um, hopefully that makes sense. I kind of was stuttering over my words, so I apologize. But yeah, the answer to the question is, um, let me pull it up real quick, my bad. Um, A, they both gain from these terms of trade. Hopefully all of that made sense. I was kind of struggling right there, um, tripping over my words. If you have any questions on that segment specifically, uh, you can just DM me. I'll hopefully explain it better. Um, but yeah, so question 7A. Ed and Ruth grow strawberries and raspberries. Ed has a comparative advantage in producing raspberries, or er, in producing strawberries, if blank. We already know a comparative advantage is whenever your opportunity cost for producing something is lower than the person, the other person you're compared to. So, Ed would have the comparative advantage of producing strawberries if his opportunity cost was lower than whenever Ruth were to grow strawberries. And that can be seen uh, in answer C. Ruth's opportunity, uh, Ruth's opportunity cost for producing strawberries is greater than Ed's opportunity cost for producing strawberries. So Ed's is lower. Um, so the answer is C. Now let's go on to 7B. Ed and Ruth can grow strawberries and raspberries. If Ed has an absolute advantage in growing strawberries and raspberries, he will blank. Um, so if he has an absolute advantage in both, that does not mean there's no reason to trade. That's, that's not at all what that means. He will still, he can't, because even if he has the absolute advantage in both, he will not have the comparative advantage in both. So there's still a good reason to trade because his opportunity cost for making strawberry or for making raspberries is higher than Ruth's as we established in the last question. So whenever we go through the answer choices, there's A. That means that he cannot gain from specialization of trade. Absolutely not. He can definitely gain because we know he has a comparative advantage in strawberries, which means by default, Ruth is going to have the one for a comparative advantage in raspberries. B. 
have an equal opportunity cost in performing all activities. That's not true at all. It's already been established that Ed has a comparative advantage, so there's no way he could have an equal opportunity cost for both. Uh, C, that makes him a better farmer than Ruth. Um, I, I don't know. That's just a stupid one. Uh, no, just no. Never, never pick one of those answers. There's no real way to quantify. You just want to go with like the economic principles. That's just a really random answer. Or D, uh, he has a comparative advantage in one activity, but not both. We already know this. You cannot have a comparative advantage in both activities. You can only have a comparative advantage in one. All right. Um, okay, I'm going to switch over to the paper. I'll be right back. Ignore this little graph area down here. So Enid owns an ice cream parlor. Uh, question 8A. Enid owns an ice cream parlor. In an hour, she can produce 20 milkshakes or 120 ice cream sundaes. Bill owns an ice cream parlor. In an hour, he can produce 13 milkshakes or 52 ice cream sundaes. Uh, this says sundaes, by the way. Um, calculate Enid's opportunity cost for producing a milkshake. All right. So this is easy. It's just telling us what to do. We only have to do one person. So opportunity cost, as you know, it's what you lose when you choose. So lose over choose, or as she says, sacrifice over gain. And so Enid is choosing to make her 20 milkshakes, but she's losing out on 120 Sundays. Um, so yeah, let's just find out this. And the opportunity cost is six. And now I know it says her opportunity cost of producing one milkshake, but as you know, um, if you were to divide both of these by 20, it would just be six over one. It simplifies itself just in case that tripped anyone up. I don't think it did. Uh, I just like to make sure everything's on the table. Question 8B. Now, this one is the exact same question, but now it just wants Bill's opportunity cost for producing milkshakes. So the exact same thing, what you lose when you choose. So this is E, and let's go to B. So Bill is choosing to make uh, 13, but he's losing out on 52 Sundays. Now, that is four. Um, yeah, so Bill... The answer is just four for that. And then question 8C. Blank has a comparative advantage in milkshakes, and blank has an absolute advantage in both goods. Now this one's switching, up, switching it up a little bit. Um, Bill's, so here's the opportunity costs for the milkshakes. Bill's opportunity cost is lower, so we know he has a comparative advantage in the milkshakes. So that's the first answer. The first blank is Bill, but the second blank, who has an absolute advantage in both goods? This is actually pretty simple. You can just look. 20 is bigger than 13. 120 is bigger than 52. And that belongs to Enid. That's what she produces. So Enid has the absolute advantage in both goods. So the answer is D, Bill, Enid. Okay, I apologize. This is an even more awkward setup, but I had to put it on something taller in order to get the whole paper in frame. Regardless, let's do this. Um, so this is question nine. Two, uh, two countries, orange, rose, and blue, violet, produce only two goods, teapots and awfully hot coffee pots. The table gives the production possibilities. Blank has a comparative advantage in teapots, and blank has a comparative advantage in uh, coffee pots. So let's see. Um, orange, rose. Now, a lot of you guys may be tempted to pick a... Uh, like row and just roll with it, but that's actually I think that's what they want to trip you up on So orange rows, um, this is their table and we want to see who has the compare Let's find out who has the comparative advantage for teapots first So for teapots you they could either make 360 teapots or 60 teapots because if they're making if you like were to look at a production possibility curve 360 would be making zero coffee pots um so, yeah, as you can see here, and then making 60 coffee pots is making zero of this. Whenever it comes to um, these kinds of questions, you want to see what they, uh, who has the higher opportunity cost or lower opportunity cost by comparing both of them at zero, if that makes any sense. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like how in the last question, um, it said Enid can make 20 milkshakes or 120 sundaes. 
Enid could produce anywhere in between those two numbers, but this is just saying like the highest two, you know, to see who has the actual comparative advantage. The same principle is going to apply here. So we want to see who has the uh, comparative advantage in teapots. So opportunity cost, as you know, you're probably tired of hearing it, what you lose when you choose. So it's lose over choose. So here we're choosing to make teapots, so 360 teapots, but we're losing out on coffee pots. So as you can see here, this is one six. Um, and then definitely didn't pause because I uh, don't know math. Uh, so let's look at blue violet. Blue violet could either make 20 teapots or 120 coffee pots. So let's, we're choosing to make the 20 teapots. So 20, but we're uh, teapots down here, and then we're losing out on 120 coffee pots. So the opportunity cost here is much higher. So as we can see, Orange Rose has the comparative advantage in teapots since their um, opportunity cost is lower. And since they have the comparative advantage in teapots, Blue Violet will automatically have the comparative advantage in um, coffee pots, because you can't have a comparative advantage in both, as you know. Um, so yeah, I think that's a standalone question. It is. Hopefully that makes sense, um, this whole table thing. That's the uh, hardest part of the question. Question 10. Claire and Doug are farmers who produce beef and corn. In a year, Claire produces 10 tons of beef and 100 bushels of corn. In a year, Doug produces 10 tons of beef and 80 bushels of corn. To maximize their total output of beef and corn, blank. So here we're trying to find out how they can consume outside of their PPC. And as we know, the best way or the only way to do that is to um, trade. So we have to find out who should specialize in what. So let's find out who has the absolute advantage in beef production. So as you know, opportunity cost is what you lose when you choose or what you sacrifice uh, over what you gain. This is the formula. So we're choosing to make 10 beefs for a player. We're choosing to make 10 beefs, but when we choose to make 10 beefs, we lose out on 100 corn. So her opportunity cost is 10. So for every beef she produces, she loses out on 10 corn uh, she could have been making. And for Doug, whenever he chooses to make 10 tons of beef, he loses out on 80 bushels of corn. So for every uh, unit of beef or every ton of beef he produces, he loses out on, oh my bad, I didn't realize this was outside. He loses out on eight, uh, bush, eight bushes of corn. So the lower opportunity cost here goes to Doug, meaning Doug should specialize in corn. Um, or Doug should specialize in beef. I'm sorry, y'all. Because um, he has the lower oppor opportunity cost when producing beef. And if Doug specializes in beef, Claire should specialize in corn, which is answer B. Um, yeah. Question 11A. Tony and Patty produce skis and snowboards. The tables show their production possibilities. Tony produces four snowboards and eight skis a week. So Tony's producing right here on this line. Um... And then Patty produces nine snowboards and 18 skis a week. So she's producing there. Is the following statement true or false? Tony has a comparative advantage in producing snowboards. Now we have to test this. Uh, again, as we know, comparative advantage is who has the lower opportunity cost. And opportunity cost is what you lose when you choose or what you sacrifice or when you gain. So lose over choose. So... Similar to the last question with the table, we have to take the top point, so the maximum amount of snowboards you can make, and that means whenever you're making the max, you're losing out on the max of skis. So whenever Tony makes snowboards, he chooses to make 20, but he's losing out on 10 skis, which makes his opportunity cost one half. So every one snowboard he makes, he loses out on half a ski he could be making. So I guess one, one ski. Um, Oh, whoops. And then, so this is for Tony. Now let's look at Patty. Patty's opportunity cost. Um, she's losing, or she's choosing to make 
18 snowboards. And since she's choosing 18, she's losing out on 36. So her opportunity cost is two. Well, and as we know, the higher opportunity cost means you should not specialize in this. Tony has the lower opportunity cost. So he has a comparative advantage in snowboards, making this statement true. Question 11b. Uh, so it's the exact same thing, but it says, is the following statement true or false? Tony has a comparative advantage in producing skis. Well, we just established that he has the comparative advantage in producing snowboards, and you can't have a comparative advantage in producing both. So the answer is false. He does not. Question 11C. Originally, Tony produced four snowboards and eight skis a week, and Patty produces nine snowboards and 18 skis a week. If Tony and Patty now specialize in trade, blank specializes in snowboards and produces blank. So we already know that Tony has the comparative advantage in um, snowboards, so he should specialize in it. But how many should he produce? Well, since they're, uh, since they're trading, he should produce the absolute max of snowboards since he's better at it. Um, there's no reason to do a hybrid here because he's going to get all his skis from Patty, who produces them better. And this is how, um, this is how you can consume outside of your pr production possibility curve. So Tony should produce 20 snowboards. Uh, answer A. Question 11D. Originally... Okay, so originally Tony was producing four snowboards and eight skis a week, and Patty was producing nine snowboards and 18 skis a week. If Tony and Patty now specialize in trade, blank specializes in speed, uh, skis. Well, if Tony's uh, specializing in snowboards, that means Patty should specialize in skis. Well, how many should we produce? Uh, we know you should produce the max amount. Uh, she shouldn't be producing any snowboards since Tony does it better. And... Yeah, so she should be producing 36 skis. So the answer is Patty, 36 skis, which is C. Question 11E. Originally, before specialization, Tony produced four snowboards and eight skis a week, and Patty produced nine snowboards and 18 skis a week. Now, after specialization, the total number of snowboards produced, or the total number of snowboards produced blanked by seven. Well, we know specialization of trade is a good thing, so, and it's more efficient overall for the economy, so it will increase. And the total number of skis produced will blink. It will also increase, and we can see, or increase by 10. And we can see this um, since Tony was making eight skis and Patty was making 18 skis, so that's 26. But now, Caddy's just, or Patty's just making 36 skis, and Tony's making none. So now there's 36. So this is now, and this is then. That is an increase of 10. Uh, this is a 3, my bad. That is an increase of 10. And the same could be seen for the snowboards. Because um, he was producing 4, Patty was producing 9, which is um, 13. So this 13 is the then. But now Tony's just producing 20, and I can't hold my pencil. So now Tony produces 20. That is an increase of 7. All right, we're stepping away from the math equations, and we're going into the more of the principles of economics. These are going to be a lot of definitions, so they're going to be kind of hard to explain, and they're just going to be something you need to know. So question 12. Economic growth is defined as the blank. Well, economic growth is whenever your production possibility curve shifts outwards. You do that with economic growth. So let's see which one of these answers best fits that. Recovery from a recession. Not necessarily. Your economy does not need a recession to grow. Overtaking the United States by China. Um, more economies in the country, or more countries' economies can grow, not just these two, and it does not have to take over another country for your economy to grow. Sustained expansion of production possibilities. This is the correct answer, because um, you're, uh, the keyword there is sustain. You're, for a long time, keeping up this new and better way of producing things which means you're going to be making more things, which means you have more things to sell, which means your economy will grow. And then D, an increase in wage rates. This could be it, but not always. Um, so yeah, the answer is C. Question 13. Technological change is the blank, um, is the blank, new goods, and a blank of producing goods and services. So technolog technological change is the development of new goods 
and better ways of producing goods and services. For example, whenever you have your production possibility curve, the only way to make it go outwards, which is economic growth, is to um, have technological growth, um, technological change. And that can be seen with the development of a new technology that can help make things easier. So for example, the printing, pre the printing press was a huge technological change. Um, it was just a new invention that made books way easier to produce and it drastically shifted out the production possibility curve. Or just making, finding better ways to make a good or service. Um, just like being more efficient with your resources, like the assembly line with cars. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Again, these are kind of hard to explain. Question 14, capital, capital accumulation is the blank, including blank capital. Well, this one, it's in the name. Capital accumulation is the growth of capital resources. You're accumulating more capital. And this includes human capital. Um, this could be seen by like how we're in school. We could be working a full-time job, but we want to grow our human capital. We're capitally, we're accumulating our capital right now because we're growing our capital resources. And in this case, it's human capital. Um, so yeah, the answer is D because our human capital is like our education and stuff. Um, question 15, what generates economic growth? E economic growth comes from blank. Now this is just throwing everything we just talked about all into one nice little blow, uh, one, nice, one nice little bow. Capital accumulation and technological advances is the answer. Um, that's how economic growth comes from because we already know why technological advance does it, uh, advances does it, because um, you're making new things, you're producing things better. Whenever you produce things better, you can produce more of them. And the more you produce, the more you can sell. Your economy is going to grow. And capital accumulation, this could be human or physical. Um, physical capital is like machines and stuff. And whenever you get new machines, it's going to make everything more efficient. And whenever you have people who are better at things, it's more efficient. Economic growth, it all comes together perfectly. So yeah, question 16. Complete the following statement. The opportunity cost of economic growth is blank. So whenever you decide to focus on your economy, there's something you're going to have to give up. Uh, you can't just get everything. There's always a, economics is all about scarcity and it's always a tug of war type thing. Whenever you decide to focus on your economy for the future, you're losing out on things you could be making today. It's like a production possibility curve where there's investing in your future and then there's what you can do today. Now, you can't just have all of both. You have to find a good middle ground there. So the answer is D. Uh, so the opportunity cost of economic growth is fewer consumption goods today. Okay, question 17. Okay, this is a doozy. So hopefully we're all here for this. Two countries, A and B, originally have identical production possibility curves. However, these two countries make different choices regarding which bundle to produce. Goods, um, oh wait, my bad, I, I missed a line. Country A chooses a production bundle of 50 units of consumption goods and 30 units of capital goods. So country A is focusing more on the now. They have 50 nows and 30 futures. Um, country B chooses a bundle with only 30 consumption goods and 50 capital goods. So country B is looking at the future. Country B has 50 futures and 30 nouns. So the pink PPF A and PPF B, uh, which is the production possibility curve for country A and B, uh, their lines each show the country's uh, production possibility curve after one year. Clearly, the production possibilities of country B grew faster than country A, and that's because they invested more in their future. Uh, the graphical scenario illustrates the opportunity cost of economic growth is foregone current consumption. This is literally just the last question, but now they visualize it for you. Um, you can see it on your own. Uh, you have the own graph. As you can see, uh, the blue line is the original. That's what they were at. But then country B decided to focus more on the future. And a year later, you can see how much further it got them. While country A decided to focus more on the present. So the opportunity cost was the foregone current consumption. Um, same as to the last question. That one's just, it's like, it's one that's trying to trip you up. It's really simple. Question 18, complete the statement. 
an economy that uses new technology blank. Well, technological growth shifts your production possibility curve outwards. So an economy that is using new technology will experience an outward shift in its uh, production possibility curve, which is C. It's, um, and then if you look at the other options, does not incur opportunity cost. That's not true. There's always opportunity cost. I don't know if she said this or if y'all know about this, but there's like the whole thing about economics is there's no such thing as a free lunch. It costs something. You're, there's always a cost to literally everything. And it's usually an opportunity cost. And here, there's an opportunity cost. Um, and it does not accumulate capital, so economic growth is free. Nothing is free. We just assessed that. Um, moves along the production possibility and incurs an opportunity cost. Now, that's not true. This is the new technology. So you're not going to move along. You're going to move the whole curve over. Um, so yeah, experience is an hour shift. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, question 19. Two countries, alpha and beta, have identical production possibility frontiers. If alpha produces at point A and beta produces at point B, then blink. So this is a PPC that has capital goods on one axis and consumption goods on another axis. And as we know, capital goods are for the future and then consumption goods are for now. Country B is focusing on now and country A is focusing on consumption or er, Country B is focusing on the future, my bad, and country A is focusing on now. Uh, hopefully you can be looking, you can pull the graph up and you can see what I'm saying because B is producing more capital goods, which will help them in the future more. So if alpha produces a point A and beta produces a point B, then blank. Alpha is consuming more than beta today, but they will grow slower than beta. This is what we know. Um, this is just the simple, this is the two questions ago. The opportunity cost of economic growth is consumption today. That's just the exact same question in a different uh, outfit. Um, so yeah. My bad. Uh, question 20. Firms are institutions that organize blank of goods and services. Um, so this, you need to study uh, the graph that has households at the top, firms at the bottoms, and then the product market, and then the labor market and then all the arrows, you need to know that. That is vitally important. Um, so firms are institutions that organize the production of goods and services. Um, that one's pretty much common sense. I'm pretty sure most of y'all could uh, just kind of know that from like living, you know? Cause like we are the consumers and then firms are the producers. Um, it's So they're gonna, you know, organize the production of goods that we're gonna buy. It's just, yeah. Question 21. A market is an arrangement that brings blank together and enables them to get information and do business with each other. This is just a definition, um, but the answer is buyers and sellers. Um, we will wrote this down in class. It's just something you need to know. A market is an arrangement that brings the buyers and sellers together. Not much of an explanation there. It's just something you have to know. Question 22. Property rights are legally established titles to ownership, use, and disposal of blank, and uh, and goods and services that are enforceable in courts. I struggled with this question a lot at first. Uh, if you did too, I think it would help to know that there's supposed to be a comma after use, or after use. Um, so it's actually a list of things, because I don't know. That really tripped me up. So yeah, hopefully that helps, but let's get into the actual question. We know that property rights um, protect what you own. Um, so property rights are legally established titles to the ownership. Use, so you can use what you own, and disposal, and you can dispose whatever you want there, of blank and goods and services. Well, so what are the two things? There's the goods and services, and then there's the factors of production. Um, Again, this is another definition, but this is one that you can kind of reason your way through if you just kind of think about it. Um, but yeah, so property rights are legally established titles to ownership, use, and disposal of factors of production and goods and services. Um, it's a definition. I'm sorry that I keep on doing the same thing for the definitions, but I just try to explain them and realize it's a definition, so it's kind of hard because it's a definition. Wow, I can say that a hundred more times. Question 23. Complete the following sentence. Social institutions 
such as firms, markets, property rights, and money, blank? Um, so the answer is, are required for society to enjoy the benefits and specialization of trade. Um, so yeah, this is a principal thing without money, um, without money or like firms, markets, all these things are needed. These are all the key components of an economy. An economy without these things can't really trade because their value would be inconsistent. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, we can go through the other ones and I can explain why they're wrong since I'm struggling to explain the answer. Uh, so eliminate scarcity, impossible, nothing is infinite. Um, and then there's C, which is, are not required for society to enjoy the benefits of specialization and trade. That's not true. They're definitely required. Um, it's literally the opposite of A, so obviously it's not true, uh, which is the correct answer. And then there's D, gives comparative advantage in all goods and services to advanced economies. We already know that you're never going to have all the comparative advantages. Um, you always will be lacking uh, on comparative advantages. That's the whole uh, principle behind trade. Um, so yeah, one last time, social institutions such as firms, markets, property rights, and money are required for society to enjoy benefits and specialization of trade. Question 24. This is back to the household and firms graph um, with the labor market and the factory market, or the factory market and the product market. Um, complete the sentence, the following sentence. Blank, blank chooses the quantity of labor, land, capital, and entrepreneurship, or the factors of production, to sell or rent. And then the other one is blank chooses the quantities of factors of production to hire. Well, we already know that firms hire us. Uh, that's, that, that's what's in the wage market. Well, I shouldn't go there yet. We're not there yet. But... Firms buy our labor. That's what they do. And they hire us. So the second blank is um, firms. And the first blank is households because we use our land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship as ways to like set ourselves apart. Um, and we sell all of those things um, just in different ways. Like you, The most common one is selling your human capital. Or actually, it would actually be labor just because uh, manual labor jobs are the most common and like easy to score. So yeah, hopefully that made sense. Uh, question 25. Demand is the blank when all other influences on buying plans remain the same. So demand is the relationship between the quantity demanded of a good and the price of the good. Um, this is a definition, but it makes a lot more sense graphically. Quantity demanded is the um, on the demand curve at any single point that you go to, that's the quantity demanded at that price. So the whole line is just an infinite amount of quantity demanded um, points, all at an infinite amount of prices. Um, so yeah, that's what a demand curve is. That's just what, uh, uh, that's just it. Um, yeah. Question 26. A demand curve shows the relationship between blank and blank when all other influences on buying plans remain the same. This is what I just said. It's the quantity demanded of a good at what price it's at. So every time you move the price, and uh, increase or decrease the price, the quantity demanded will change. And that's what creates the line. And let's think about this. Um, if the price were to go up of a good, our quantity demanded will go down. So, with price on the uh, x-axis, whenever it's up and the quantity demanded on the y-axis, um, whenever it's like at the highest it can be, our quantity demanded will be zero. But whenever it's, when it's at the lowest it can be, um, our quantity demanded will be the absolute maximum. So demand goes down. Demand is down. Double Ds. So yeah, uh, the answer to 26 is quantity demanded of a good and its price. Those are the two things um, that make demand. So which of the following statements by, about Tom demonstrates, um, demonstrates that his buying plan obeys the law of demand? The law of demand is that whenever the price of a good increases, the quantity demanded will go down and vice versa. So let's look at all of these and see which one fits the law of demand. 
For me, a good course website is a substitution for a textbook. Um, no, that has nothing to do with uh, price, which is a key part of the law of demand. So that's not it. At an average price of $80 per textbook, I plan to buy five textbooks next semester. That does not have anything to do with um, the law of demand since it doesn't indicate a change in price. Um, and then C, I can't afford as many textbooks because my rent has increased. That is a determinant of demand, but it has nothing to do with quantity demanded or a price change of the textbook itself. It's an outside factor. Um, and the law of demand ignores outside factors. It's only the price of the good. And then there's D, the only thing that's changed is the price of textbooks. So as you know, the only thing that can change. They've become more expensive and now I'm not buying any. Law of demand, when the price goes up, quantity demanded goes down and the opposite. So the answer is D. Question 28. Jeb makes the following four statements about peanuts. Which statement uh, best describes his quantity demanded in the peanut market? Okay, so let's go through these. There's A. I'll stop eating peanuts when I could afford to buy walnuts. Um, that has nothing to do with his quantity demanded because um, that has nothing to do with the price of peanuts. I ate peanuts to complement cola. Again, that has nothing to do with the price of peanuts, so that's not it. At a price of $1 per pack, I plan to buy two packs of peanuts per week. Perfect. That's literally everything we've ever wanted. And then there's D. If peanuts were less expensive, I'd buy them more often. Um, so yeah, that one's not true because that's saying, that's like the law of demand. It's He's stating the law of demand, but he's not saying the quantity he is demanding, which is what the question is asked. So we want to know the quantity demanded, not debt. Not that the law of demand exists. We know that. So yeah. Um, question 29. Define the quantity demanded of a good or service. The quantity demanded of a good or service is blank. Um, so... The quantity demanded of a good or service is measured as an amount per unit of time. Um, so let's go back to the last example, question 28, where we found out that his quantity demanded in the peanut market was at a price of $1 per pack. I plan to buy two packs every week. That is, um, so measured as an amount. So your dollar sign and how often you're buying it. So a, an example of that would be if they're $1, I'll buy two a week. That's that's um the answer. Quantity demanded of a good or service is measured as an amount that you're paying or the amount that you're getting for the price for every unit of time. So every time you'll repeat that cycle. So an example for me, I'm a, a big energy drink guy. I love Monster Energy. Um, I drink one Monster a day. So my quantity demanded... It's going to be one for so my my quantity demanded at the current price of monsters, which is four twenty five for two, will be I'll get I'll buy two every two days. That's that's uh, my quantity demanded of monster at a price of four twenty five. Hopefully that made sense. Um, so yeah. Oh okay perfect. We're starting to get into ones that are much easier to explain. Question 30. Which of the following statements about the market for uh, chicken describes a change in quantity demanded? And which is a change in demand? So, change in quantity demanded is only indicated by the price of the good. Nothing else can change quantity demanded. Only the price of that specific good. Now, other things can change demand. Um, we'll get into that later. So there's four statements. We have to find out which ones fit into quantity demanded and which ones fit into demand. Statement one, people are buying less chicken because the price of beef has fallen. That is demand because people are buying less chicken since the price of beef has fallen. That has nothing to do with quantity demanded. And in fact, um, that means that beef is a substitute good for chicken, which will change the demand for chicken. Um, so yeah. Number one is demand. Number two, people are buying less chicken because the price of chicken has increased. Law of demand right there. Quantity demanded. That's it. The price of chicken is the only thing that has changed. So therefore, the quantity demanded is going down. 
So for two, it is quantity demanded. Um, so then there's three. People are buying more chicken because the price has fallen. That's the exact same but thing as two, but flipped around. So it's quantity demanded. The only thing that's changing is the price of chicken. So then people are gonna buy more chicken. And then four, the cost of chicken feed has increased. Now that's a related good, which will change the demand for chicken. But since it's not the price of chicken itself, it is not quantity demanded. So one is demand, two is quantity demanded, three is quantity demanded, four is demand. Let's find out which one of these encompasses that. And that is answer D. One is a change in demand, and two and three are changes in quantity demand. I don't know why D decided to drop off four. Probably an error, but yeah. Question 31. In January 2010, the price of gasoline was $2.70 a gallon. By spring of 2010, the price had increased to $3 a gallon. Assume that there were no changes in average income, population, or any other influence on buying plans. Given the law of demand, you would expect the rise of the price of gasoline to decrease the quantity of gasoline demanded and blank the demand for gasoline. Now this one, this uh, last blank is trying to trick you. So if the only thing that changes is the price of gasoline itself, that does not shift demand. That does not at all shift demand. That only shifts quantity demanded. And since it, the price rose, quantity demanded will decrease. And since only the price of gasoline itself changed, there will be no change in the demand for gasoline. So question 31 is C, decrease, not change. Question 32. What is the law of demand and how do we illustrate it? The law of demand states that the other thing, or that all things remaining the same, so ceteris paribus, the blank, pri the blank price of a good, the blank. The higher price of a good, the smaller the quantity demanded. I've been saying, oh, excuse me. I've been saying it for a while, but that's just what it is. It works the other way around. The lower uh, the price of a good, the higher quantity demanded, but that's not one of the option choices. So the higher the price of a good, the lower quantity demanded. D. Question 33. A demand curve illustrates the law of demand, or a demand curve that illustrates the law of demand blank. It's downward sloping. We know this. Demand is downward sloping. Um, that's just that. It's that simple. The higher the price of a good, the less you're going to buy, which is why it starts at the top, because the price is on the y-axis. Um, and then the amount that you're uh, the amount of the good is on the x-axis. So whenever it's at its highest price, you're buying the least amount. Whenever it's at its lowest price, you're buying the most amount. Boom! Goes straight down. Demand goes down. Supply to the sky, demand goes down. Question 34. What are the influences on buying plans that change demand? And do these influences increase or decrease demand? When an event occurs that changes demand for coffee makers, blank if demand increases and blank if demand decreases. So this is just saying graphically what happens whenever demand changes. Well, if demand of coffee maker increases, the demand curve will move to the right. Um, and then if it, uh, and if the demand for coffee makers would decrease, demand would move to the left. Um, and then graphically, it still makes sense. Um, if demand decreases, then, well, I'm gonna graph it out of here. So when demand increases, they're going to charge less for each unit of good. Um, and whenever demand decreases, they're going to have to charge more for each thing you buy since um, they're going to have to make up their profits, you know? So yeah, whenever it increases, the demand curve goes to the right. Whenever it decreases, the demand curve goes to the left. Graphically, hopefully that makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's just uh, a law that you need to know. All right, perfect. Question 35. So as the average income in China continues to increase, Explain how the following will change. So there's two things. There's the demand for beef and the demand for rice. So as the average income of China continue to increase, continues to increase, we would expect the demand for beef to blank and the demand for rice to blank. So if income is increasing, the demand for beef will increase 
if beef is a normal good, and the demand for rice will decrease if rice is an inferior good. Um, normal goods and inferior goods, uh, pretty simple. Um, let's say that I'm working a job, but then I get laid off due to COVID. Now, I might be grubbing at uh, Texas Roadhouse every night, getting a steak dinner, but now I'm going to have to downgrade to some Hot Pockets. Um, so yeah, the Hot Pockets are the inferior good, and I will only turn to them whenever my income lowers. And vice versa, let's say I'm not doing too well right now. I'm laid off from my job. I don't have anything. I'm eating Hot Pockets. And let's say that I get a promotion or I get a, like a new job or a better job. Now I'm going to be having steak dinners because I can afford to do that kind of stuff. So if beef is a normal good and the people's uh, of China's income has increased, the demand for beef is going to increase because it's a normal good. And then if rice is an inferior good, then demand is going to decrease since the wage or the income of the Chinese people is increasing. So yeah, that's just normal and inferior goods. Question 36. A substitute good is, is a good that is blank, another good. And a complement good is a good that is blank for another good. Um, so this is like probably the easiest question on here in my opinion. A substitute good is one that is consumed in place of another good. And a complement good is uh, one that is consumed together with. Um, so for example, um, a video game and a video game system. Those are complement goods. You kind of need one to use the other. And a substitute good... Um, she gave the example of Coke and Pepsi in class. Um, so, yeah, but I think something better would be like, hmm. Oh, Dr. Pepper and Mr. Pibb, bro. You literally can't tell the difference between those two. So, yeah, but yeah, I mean, that's easy. I'm not going to spend any more time on it. I believe in y'all. Question 37. Which of the following statements about a normal good and which of the following is about an inferior good? Which is about both and which is about neither? So there's four statements. Um, statement number one, with incomes falling uh, in the recession, people are buying more chicken. So people's income is going down and the amount bought of chicken is going up. That makes chicken an inferior good. Statement two, people are buying more beef now that incomes have increased. This is just like the China question. Um, income is increased, more beef is being bought. Beef is a normal good. Question three, or statement three. People are buying more chicken because the price of chicken has fallen. Now this is a matter of quantity demanded. This has nothing to do with um, normal or inferior goods or demand changing at all. The only thing that's changed is the price of chicken and quantity demanded has also changed. So that is neither inferior nor normal. So neither. And then there's four, which is statement four. With higher incomes, people are switching from chicken to beef. That's just combining one and two, basically. Uh, so it's saying people's income is going up, so they're buying less chicken and more beef. That is an example of both inferior and normal goods. So one is inferior, two is normal, three is neither, four is both, B is the answer. Question 38A. The price of our printer falls from $80 to $40. While all other influences of buying plans are unchanged, the quantity of printers demanded will increase. Law of demand. When price goes down, quantity demanded goes up. It increases. Question 38B. So you need to pull up the graph for this one. Um, actually, I can just show y'all. Uh, so the question is, uh, sorry for the shaky hands, but the question is asking, whenever it goes from the $80 price to the $40 price, how many will be bought? So it's at $80, and $4 million are bought there, but then it drops to $40. So we go over to 40 and where the demand curve is, and $12 million will be bought there. So the answer is going to be 4 and $12 million. Question 38C. Is the following statement true or false? The change in the price of a printer illustrates the law of demand in action. True. The price of the printer is changing. The quantity demanded is changing. The price of the printer is going down. The quantity demanded is going up. That's perfect. That's everything we've ever wanted. All wrapped in a beautiful little bow. Question 39.
The law of demand states that blank. The blank. Or, that the law of demand states that blank, comma, the blank, the price of the good, the smaller quantity demanded. So the law of demand states that all things held equal, so ceteris paribus, the higher the price of the good, the smaller the quantity demanded. I'll say it a hundred million more times if I have to. That's just the law of demand. It's that simple. Uh, question 40. The expected price of a smartphone next year rises. What is the result of this event? So this is another determinant of demand. If the price of a good is expected to rise, the, um, the demand for it today will increase because you're like, well, I got to get it now before it gets more expensive. Um, so yeah, the answer is C. The demand for smartphones today increases because people are going to buy it while it's still cheap. Question 41. If, as the price of pasta decreases, the quantity of pasta sauce that people buy increases, then pasta, sauce, then pasta and pasta sauce are blank. I take it back. This is actually the easiest question. You don't even have to read the first sentence. It's very obvious that pasta and pasta sauce are complement goods. But economically, this can be seen by the price of pasta decreasing and the demand for pasta going up. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty simple. I believe in you on that one. Question 42. If Adriana's, I think that's that name, uh, if Adriana's income decreases, her demand for vacation decreases. Then for Adriana, vacations are, well, her income is decreasing and she's going on less vacations. That means it is a normal good to her. And one thing about normal and inferior goods is that they vary from person to person. One man's trash is another man's treasure. One man's inferior good is another man's normal good. That's just how it is. Like, uh, I don't know. The Rock. He probably eats like a six, seven course meal with lobster, filet mignon every night. Uh, and to him, that's normal. But for me, what's normal is like some Hot Pockets or some ramen noodles. To him, that is without a doubt an inferior good. So that's an example of how... Um, how normal and inferior goods are from person to person. Question 43. Suppose the price of a Sunday falls, but the other influences on buyers' actions remain the same. If the price of a Sunday falls, or if the price of a Sunday falls, a blank, uh, a blank, the demand curve occurs. So if only the price of a Sunday is fall, demand is not changing. That means if the price of the Sunday falls, more people are going to buy it, which means you're moving down along the curve since this is the amount people are buying and the price is falling you're going down because people are going to buy more that's the law of demand so you're moving down along the curve if any factors that influence the buying plans of other other than the price changes then a blank of the demand curve will occur well that's a shift if something changes that affects the influence of buying that isn't price the entire demand curve will move instead of quantity demanded. Question 44. Ski trips and ski jackets are complements. If the price of ski trips decreases, how does the demand for ski jackets change? If the price for ski trips decreases, the demand for jackets will increase. And the demand, for, and the demand curve for the jackets will shift rightward. Because the price of jackets themselves is not changing. It's the price of a complement good that is changing that is increasing its demand. Question 45. Miles graduates from college and his income is $30,000 a year. Nothing else changes. Miles decreases the quantity of donuts and potato chips that he buys and increases the quantities of bottled waters he buys. For Miles, donuts and potatoes are inferior goods. That's, or er, donuts and potato chips are inferior goods because his income increased by $30,000 a year. Nothing else changed. He bought less of those. So to him, they were inferior goods. Question 46, we're at the end. Perfect. A golf club membership is a normal good. If the price of a golf club membership is expected to rise next year, you predict that the demand for a golf club membership will increase now. This is the, in other words, just determinative of demand. If the price of something is expected to raise, people will buy it more now. It works the other way around. If the price of something is expected to drop, people are going to do it less. Um... That could be seen a lot with technology because it's a very depreciating asset. 
Um, some people like to wait a year before buying the, or, or wait a year or two before buying a new iPhone because they know the price is going to drop because they know how fast things change. So yes, that is everything. Hopefully this helped. This one was a lot longer. Um, I tried to make it more cohesive. I tried to show more work. Um, so yeah, hopefully this helps. I'm glad to help y'all. Um, yeah, hope y'all do well on the quiz or whatnot. And yeah, y'all have a great night.